Worship rise up out of your belly. Let a sound of exaltation come up out of you.
Jesus, my intercessor. Jesus, my elder brother. Jesus, my high priest. Oh, Jesus, my mediator. Jesus, my intercessor. Jesus, my elder brother. Jesus, my high priest. Oh, Jesus, my mediator. Jesus, my intercessor. Jesus, my elder brother. Jesus, my high priest.
all your sins. He heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. I don't know why you're so quiet. This is good news. Come on, come on. Forget not his benefits. He forgives your sins. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I don't know where you were at emotionally or mentally when you walked into this room, but I can tell you right now that God is faithful and you can trust him. Don't you dare forget his benefits. Don't you dare forget his character. Don't you dare forget his great love and compassion. Hasn't he already given the blood of his one and only son? Will he not give you much more than this? Has he not made a way and will he not do it again? We thank you, Lord. We recognize your holy presence in this place. God, let us never rush by. You are the most important person in the room. You're the reason why we're here. We want to tell you that we love you. You are our Lord, our creator, our master. God, you have brought us out of darkness into marvelous light, so we live to declare the praises of our God. We call you faithful. We call you trustworthy. We call you good. And Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful that when we sought you, you heard us, that your ear was not deaf, that your arm was not short. You are not an idol who cannot hear our prayers. You hear us, you see us, oh God, and you answer. You are faithful to deliver, Lord. You are faithful and mighty to save. So we exalt you in this house. We exalt you in this house, Lord. Yeah, 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 come on, just exalt, just exalt him. He's good, he's good, he's good. Man, I'm so thankful for a church that is presence over program. We value his sweet, mighty, beautiful presence. There's nothing like it on earth. And I'm so thankful that you are learning. We are all learning to wait on the Lord, to wait on the Lord and to minister to him together in the house, amen? Well, we're just gonna continue in our service. We're gonna stay in his presence. He's here, he's not going anywhere. He's gonna speak, he's gonna continue to move. But in this next portion of our service, uh, you're gonna see there are three ways that you can give on the screen. Hey, we say we trust in God. We sought him, he's answered, he's done miracles. So wherever you're at, you can trust him again. You can trust him again. Listen, we bring our tithe. We don't give our tithe because the tithe already belongs to him. We bring our tithe and we give an offering. We give to missions. We have a joy to give. The Lord says that he loves a cheerful giver, someone who's excited to put their seed in the kingdom. So if you're ready to do that this morning, there's three ways that you can give. You'll see them on the screen, but you're not gonna get out of it. You're gonna greet somebody today. Turn around, find a brother or sister, make them feel welcome, let them know that you're glad they're here.
get ready for an awesome night out. On Saturday, October the 12th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., we're hosting Camp Creek Kids Backyard Fire Pit Party. Thanks, guys. Picture this. S'mores, apple cider, and fun games all by the church pond. It's a fall party you will love. This event is only for parents and kids ages 5 to 12. Sorry, nobody under 5 for this one. And this is not a drop-off event. This night was created for you and your kids to connect and make new friends. To be part of the fun, you just need to register on the website. In a world that's always on the go, let's take a moment to pause and pray. Join us here tomorrow night at Mustang Creek for Monday Prayer, where we'll slow down, seek God's face, and find rest in His presence. As always, you can find events, sermons, and connect on the website so it's easy to get plugged into community. Now it's time to lean in and receive the fresh revelation God has for us today. Well, good morning again, same person. Um, hey, uh, if you did not know it, can you believe that a, a whole percentage of our church decided they were just going to go on vacation and leave us? So a whole lot of uh, our families are on the church cruise. How dare they? How dare they take a break? How dare they have a little rest and some fun? Hey, that's good. That's biblical. We're glad they're having fun. We're glad they're having a good time. Um, but as Pastor Robert is there this morning, we have a special treat. Um, I really, really honor um, our missions pastor, Pastor Gaylord. Um, if you ever get the chance to, to have a conversation with him, man, he could blow your mind with some incredible stories of his time on the mission field. He has such a heart to see the gospel go to every nation every creed, every tribe, every language. And so would you just help me honor and welcome Pastor Gaylord as he comes and shares the word with us this morning. Thank you, Kayla. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking around wondering who she's talking about. It's great to be here this morning. You know, in... Uh, in <laughs> I'm not sure, I think it was in the country of Malawi. Every time we would uh, come and greet someone, somebody would say, it's great to be here. <clears throat> and then they would answer with, it's good to be here. And then you would answer back, it's good to be here. And they would say, no, it's great to be here. So it's just kind of a round robin like that. It's good to be here, it's great to be here. It's both of them. Wow. I'm glad you're not on a cruise. I said this morning in the first service, I, you know, I, I don't understand cruises. I've been on a couple, and, and the cruise is either good or it's bad. And uh, I'm not going to say they're good. <laughs> but I'm not going to say they're bad either. You get plenty of eat on a cruise, I know that. You know, you try to watch your weight, and you go on a cruise, and you watch your weight all right, but it just goes the wrong direction. If you imagine with me for a moment that you're at a charity auction and the bidding starts for a small item, a vintage wrist watch. But as the auction progresses and it seems like there's a, a fervor among the, the group that's there bidding and all of a sudden it just goes wild. It, it, the bidding gets higher and higher and higher and higher, this, this vintage wristwatch that seemingly is absolutely worthless, maybe even not, not worth it, what they're bidding, but all of a sudden it gets into the thousands and even the hundreds of thousands of dollars for this vintage wristwatch. And everybody's like, what is going on here? This is, this is ridiculous. And the auctioneer stops and explains something. The wristwatch belonged to a man who gave his life to save many, many people. And all of a sudden, it was understood that the wristwatch's value was in the incredible gift that the man gave of his own life to save others. In a far greater way, the gift of God gave us through Jesus Christ is more valuable than anything that you and I can imagine. It's not just any gift. It's the ultimate expression of love and sacrifice. And as we turn today to John 3.16 in your Bible, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read that. 
we'll discover just how costly and incredible this gift really is and why it changed absolutely everything. So I'm going to ask you to read along with me this short passage of Scripture. We'll be reading it in the New Revised Standard Version, so you can look on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. And let's read it out loud together, will you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you this morning, asking you to open our hearts, enlighten your word to us, and help us to receive the fullness of this scripture. Make it alive in each one of our spirits, we ask, and we will give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you as you're seated. Today we're diving into one of the most powerful and well-known verses in all of Scripture. I'm sure that if I polled this congregation, probably everyone here could quote this passage of Scripture by heart. Now I have a little bit of problem, even though I put that up on New Revised Standard Version. That's foreign to me. <laughs> i got to be truthful with you. King James Version sounds a whole lot better to me than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Now, King James, is, uh, I know uh, it's taken a hit these days. It's looked upon as a less than adequate version of the Scripture. Uh, the New Revised Standard Version um, is kind of more uh, accurate in all that it has. But I've got to tell you, I just love the King James Version. You know, I, ever since I started my walk with Christ, every scripture I've memorized is King James. Every scripture that I can hear, you know, is King James. So when we, uh, when we finished our pastoral ministry and was beginning to... Uh, move into missions ministry uh, at the church that I pastored I tried to quit using the King James and I tried to go to a newer version and it just never worked for me it just never worked but I knew when we got to Africa went to the country of Liberia and boy I met my people they had no other version than the King James they wanted no other version than the King James if you didn't preach from the King James you didn't preach and I knew I'd met my people in Liberia. Boy, I was at home. Well, today we're going to do a deep dive. You've heard the expression, lean in. Sometimes on the, on the screen when they do the announcement, it, uh, one of them will say, okay, now get ready and lean in. Well, I never knew what lean in really meant. I struggled with that. But I'm going to ask you this morning, let's lean in. I know what it means this morning. Let's get real. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at every phrase and word in this passage of, of Scripture, and we're, we're going to do a deep study on it. So if you have uh, something you want to take notes, I'd encourage you to take notes, and maybe you'll understand it a little bit better. And some of you are sitting here thinking, Can, the John 3.16, what's to understand? I already understand it all. There's nothing left for me to understand. Uh, well, maybe that's true. And if it is true for you, great, wonderful. But for a lot of us, there's, there's a little more to understand there. This single verse, this one little verse, encapsulates the heart of the gospel, revealing God's immense love for humanity and his ultimate sacrifice to save every one of us. It's more than just a familiar phrase that we have. It's a life-changing declaration of hope, and of faith and eternal life. We're going to break it down into each phrase and understand it a little better. So let's get started. For God so loved the world. We'll begin with that section right there. And this particular section, the beginning of it, reveals the character of God's love. You see, God's love is a sacrificial love. It's boundless, and it extends to the entire world regardless of sin 
and brokenness. And the Greek word that's used there for that, agape, describes this love as selfless and unconditional. Now, let me help you with that unconditional thing. You know there are people that you like, people that you really like, and people that you love. Am I right? Those people that you love and those people that you really like, they like you. They love you. Have you ever tried to love somebody that doesn't like you? That's kind of hard to do, isn't it? I'm just being honest with you this morning. It's much easier to love somebody that loves me than somebody that doesn't love me. I don't understand anybody that doesn't love me as, as a matter of fact, you know. I, I'm, a, what's wrong? I'm a lovable guy, you know. I want everybody to love me, but not everybody does love me. And that's the truth of the matter. And it's easier to love somebody that loves you. But unconditional love, that's love where they don't love you, they don't like you, they may not even acknowledge you, and yet I'm still going to love you. That's what God says to the world. He says to the whole world, I don't care how steeped you are in sin, I don't care how far away you are from me, I don't care if you curse me, I don't care if you spit on me, I don't care if... Whoa, they did that to Jesus, didn't they? And he still went to the cross. That's unconditional, boundless love. And the word they, that uh, they used here, the Greek word for the world, cosmos, we, we kind of understand cosmos. Here it doesn't just mean the physical world. Sometimes we think of the world as continents of the world or language groups of the world or different skin colors of the world. You know, the, we have a way of dividing up the world, but God has no way of dividing. He said the world, it's boundless for everybody. This highlights the radical nature of God's love, showing that he didn't want, wait for the world to deserve his love, but rather he loved while we were yet sinners. Romans 5, 8 says, But God proves this love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me see if I can help you out a little bit there. Our son is a firefighter. Well, he, he was a firefighter. He's an arson investigator now, but he's still with the fire department in Long Beach, California. And I just really, my wife and I especially, we, we are just gripped every time we read about or see those pictures of 9-11. You, everybody, that's a, embedded in, into our minds permanently. We can't get away from that. And to see the smoke billowing, to see the buildings crumbling, and see the people running as fast as they can away from all of that, and yet see all of the firefighters running into that. Boy, now that just... That just uh, that's just overwhelming on so many different levels, is it not? But to think that a fireman, that's within them, they, that's instinctively within them to go into trouble, not run away from it. You don't want firemen or, or first responders to run away from problems. You want them to run to problems. In, my, in our first pastorate uh, back in the 80s, I worked as an EMT emergency medical technician on the ambulance in the community where we were pastoring. And I tell you, anytime there was an accident, anytime there was a car wreck, anytime there was any kind of tragedy at all, when that ambulance pulled up, we jumped out and ran to that problem, not away from that problem. You see, God's love is greater than that fireman's love. Because that fireman runs in even when there may be people that don't appreciate him being there. He may run in where people don't acknowledge that he's there. He may run in where nobody cares whether he's there or not. And yet that's what God does for us. If we don't care, if we don't acknowledge, if we, if we don't understand, he still gives us unboundless, sacrificial love to rescue us, even though we don't 
know about it or want it. Then he says that he gave his only begotten son. It's the gift of God that he gives. Now, it's a little early to start thinking about gifts, but if you're the... Uh, if you're the, how, what's the word I'm looking at? I'm trying to think of the, of, the, of the great husband that you should be or the great boyfriend that you should be. You're already thinking about a gift for Christmas. Some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, no. Is it that time of year again? <laughs> I'm already thinking about a gift. I, you know, you, you're married nearly 45 years. You, you, it, it gets hard to get gifts. You know, you have, well, let me just say it. She has everything she needs, I think. Is that right, dear? (laughs) But I'm thinking about it. You know, a gift. But God gave the greatest gift. The word that's used there, the Greek word that's used there, teaches us that it's, it's that gift that is part of himself. It's the express image of God. His son is. He holds all the attributes of the Father. And the Bible says in him lives the Godhead bodily. He is part of the Godhead. And that's what God gives us when we understand John 3.16. In fact, it's such a gift that we can easily say that God is giving himself. Wow. Wow. God is stepping out of heaven himself. He wasn't born of man. He, he's, Jesus is, is fully divine and yet fully human. And that's what God is giving us. Himself. A sacrificial offering. It wasn't a casual gift. It wasn't one that was detached from emotions. It was himself. Fully, this, this only begotten son is fully God and it's unique in his relationship. And it just seems to highlight to me the costliness of the gift. Think about, think about it like this, if you will. It's like the man who's walking down the street. It's a busy it's a busy street. Cars are zipping back and forth. And, and he's got his little son's hand in his. And, he, and he's walking down the street holding on to his little son's hand. And all of a sudden he feels the, he feels the hand slip away from his hand. And he looks down and the, and the little boy darts into the street where the cars are. Instinctively, out of love, out of compassion, out of the very fact that that, that son is his. Flesh and blood. He jumps into the street and pushes that boy back and is hit by the car himself. You see, that's what God did for us. He came to this earth to give himself a sacrifice for me. For me. And every one of us sitting here today can say he did it for me. For me. Can you imagine a creator, a God of the universe gave himself to die on a cross for me? That's almost incomprehensible to our finite minds to think that God would do that. And then he says that whoever believes in him, King James, that whosoever believeth in him Here's the clincher, this call to faith. If a carpenter's in the building, you understand what I'm talking about, the clincher. You know, if you're, if you're going to nail two boards together that you want to make sure they don't come apart, you drive that nail in, and then you go to the opposite side of that board, and that piece of nail that's sticking out on the other side, you hit it down, or you grab it with the claw and bend it down and knock it back in, and it's now bent. You can't pull it out. It's clinched. That's the clincher, and that's what this is now. God is saying there's only one way you can have this and that's by faith what is faith faith is faith deserves its own bible study doesn't it 
Faith is hard to define. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Wow, think about that for just a moment, would you? Evidence of things not seen? Evidence, you you see, God says this salvation, this gift that's offered to all of us is, is by one condition only that you take it by faith. And the word, that, the Greek word that's used here means more than an intellectual agreement. You know, you sign a contract intellectually. Some people come to the altar intellectually. You know about God intellectually. You study the scriptures intellectually, but that's not good enough. It's something that's faith, not intellectual. It goes beyond intellectually. It's that thing that you can't understand. It's that thing you can't describe. It's that thing you can't grab hold of. Faith. I know that I know that I know. How do you know? I don't know. I just know. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's it's that bridge between the sinner and salvation. And this invitation that he gives to us is, is extended to whoever. Are there any whoever's in the building? Yeah, we're all whoever's, aren't we? It's a it's a it's a radical inclusive inclusivity including everyone. It doesn't matter about your background. Anybody in the building that has a bad background? It doesn't matter about your race. You know, that's the big deal now. Everything's race. All the hatred in America is stimulated by race. And I'm not saying that it's not partly true. It is. But folks, we got to get beyond that. We're Christians. We're children of Almighty God. We're whosoevers. And that's what matters. It goes beyond your past sins. Anybody got past sins that you're still still dealing with? You just can't seem to get rid of them. They they override your mind. They override your ability sometimes. And and it's a problem in your life. And you just can't get beyond it. It goes beyond our failures. Has anybody ever been a failure? Oh, how many times do we fail? How many times do we fail? And yet God still says, it's here, just take it. It's open to all, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, saint or sinner alike. Let let, let me help you out a little bit maybe. It's like a man who's drowning in the ocean. He has no hope of of salvation. He he can't see land. He's so far out. And and there's nothing he can do. And then all of a sudden, he sees a helicopter coming. And the helicopter has spotted him. And, and, And the guy opens the side door of the helicopter, and he drops a rope down out of the helicopter for the man to grab hold of. Does the man in the water who's drowning say, hmm, let me first try to figure out what's keeping that helicopter in the air. What does that man know about the tail rotor of that helicopter keeping it stable and not spinning like a gyroscope? What does that man know about about the mechanics of that, of that rope that's coming down, how it came down and how it's going to go back up again. No, he simply grabs it. And that's all he has to do is hold on to that rope by faith that he's going to be saved and yanked out of, out of that water. That's what God is giving us in John 3.16, a rope that's come down and all we have to do is hold it we don't know, have to know what makes that helicopter run. All we have to do is hold that rope. We don't have to study the Bible to grab that rope. We don't have to be intellectuals to hold that rope. We don't have to be one color or another color to hold that rope. We don't have to have so much money or not so much money. All we have to do is hold the rope. 
by faith because that's what he sent to us. Jesus, he's our lifeline. And faith in him is simply grabbing him and holding on and trusting that he will rescue us. And then he says, should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 gives us two destinies. Hold up your hand. Number one is perish. Everybody say perish. Number two, everlasting life. That's it. It gives us two destinies. Perish or everlasting life. To perish means eternal separation from God. A fate that is the just results of our sins. To perish means total domination, total destruction, total demise, total darkness. Completely destroyed, this word means. But it doesn't mean extinct. Let me explain. Haven't you heard some people say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just live my life like I want to live my life, and when I die, that's it. Don't have to worry about anything else. Or haven't you heard those country western songs where I'm going to live my life like I want to live my life, and when I die, we're going to have the biggest party we've ever had, all of us together. Fake news. Fake news. You perish is total separation from life, God. I think the Bible calls it hell. You know, you don't even hear preachers say much about hell anymore. But that's the, the first part of John 3.16's destinies. Hell. Darkness, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Total separation. Oh, don't say that, preacher. I'm not comfortable with that, preacher. Don't say that where my kids can hear that, preacher. They're going to get scared. They need to be scared because that's the ultimate separation from Almighty God. But not extinction. And then the second destiny is everlasting life. The eternal life that, that's not just a future promise for us, but a present reality. It promises what's in the future, yes, but it changes everything right here today. And now it's a life of, of restored relationship with God. And it begins now and it continues forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I can just keep going. It never stops. It's that life that Jesus talked about in John 10, 10, where he said, the thief cometh not but for what? To kill, to steal, and destroy. But I have come. Oh, boy, that's the great part. I have come that they might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. It changes everything right now. The future has changed for sure, but it changes everything. It's like that, like, like that pauper who's living on the street. He has nothing. He's scrounging for food. He's looking for a place to stay. He is so poverty stricken that it's just, he's just living day to day and that's it. And then one day he gets a letter that he's the heir to a massive amount of fortune. Ooh. He is singing a different song. His future is totally changed. But his present is changed as well. He's no longer struggling for food. He's no longer struggling for a place to sleep. He's no longer struggling for this or that. He has it all, but he has a future as well. And similarly, when we believe in Christ, we don't just have a future hope of heaven. Our new life begins right now. We're no longer spiritual paupers, but heirs of eternal life, experiencing the richness of God's grace and love right now here in the present. 
Two destinies. Everybody in this room has two destinies. Which one would you choose? The one I just described or the one that's there in front of you? Would you choose demise, destruction, separation, or would you choose eternal life? Which one? You see, John 3.16 is often called the gospel in a nutshell because it so perfectly sums up the message of salvation. In, the, in this one little verse, we see God's immense love. We see God's sacrificial giving. We see the call to faith that he calls us to and the promise of eternal life. It's not just a statement of fact. It's, it's an invitation to experience the love and grace of God in a personal, transformative way. All-inclusive. You're not going to get there with your brain. You get there with your heart. You know, I've heard someone say before that it's possible to miss heaven by about 18 inches. The distance from your head to your heart. Now, some have longer necks and it's further. Some have shorter necks and it's shorter. But you can miss heaven by letting your mind control and not your heart. I hope today you see the depths of this very small, powerful passage of Scripture. How much love God has for each one of us to give Himself. So I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe the praise team could come back. But I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Where are you in all of this this morning? Where are you sitting in John 3.16? You know the scripture. You can quote it with me. You learned it as a child in children's church or Sunday school. Probably one of the first passages of scriptures you ever memorized. John 3.16. But this gift... This gift that God has given. And, well, it's maybe kind of like this shirt. Preaching in a village in Liberia. When I finished preaching, the congregation came and gave me this shirt, which they often did every, every service that I preached there. I, I, had, I had a lot of shirts. <laughs> my wife has a lot of dresses. I thought I'd wear it today to make all my African friends just look and see what West Africa looks like. Amen? I know there's some people here from Cameroon this morning. So West Africa. It's a gift. God's given it to all of us. What are you going to do with it? If you've never really and truly understood the unconditional love that God has extended for us, if you've never really understood the sacrifice that God has made for us, I want you to contemplate on that for just a moment, would you? I want you to think what God's done for you. You know, we're a society that always goes around saying, what do you... What can you do for me? What can you do for me? What can you give me? I always got my hand out for something. Well, God's given it to you. Everything you could possibly need. Everything you could possibly want. What will you do with it? Maybe you're just starting out in your, in your journey with Christ. And, and you understand this completely and you've experienced what I'm talking about. What are you doing with that gift? that you've been given. It's kind of like a man who, who has a medicine in his hand that can cure the disease of a million people in the world with that disease. 
be incredible to think that he would put that medicine in his pocket and not give it to those that needed it the most, right? And yet that's what we have in John 3, 16. We have the, we have the gospel in our hand. Are we giving it? Are we handing it out to people? When I first met my wife, her mother and dad owned a Gulf gas station in a small town. And her dad pumped gas, fixed flats, washed windshields, you know, all the things that they used to do in a gas station. Now you get to do them. And her mother sat inside at the desk with the cash register all day, every day, except Sundays. And she'd take the money. Now, ladies, listen to what I'm saying. That man worked outside and did all that hard work, and she'd take the money. But she did something else, too. No matter who came through those doors, and no matter what problem they carried with them, they got the gospel before they left. Every one of them. I admired her mother for that, and I made it my plight in life to be that person. And I promise you this, God will always give you that open door of opportunity to share the gospel. Always. You say, well, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. I don't know what to say. I don't have an opportunity. That's not true. Every conversation, you can interject the gospel in it in some manner if you want to. And that's what God's called you to do. So I'd ask you to stand with me this morning, would you? If you're here this morning and you've never really and truly accepted Christ, embraced the, the gift of sacrifice and love that God has extended to each one of us, I'm going to invite you to come. I'm thinking there should be somebody that can pray with them. Anybody, if you're the prayer people, come and stand, would you? If you're here, the, yeah, they're coming. I didn't realize that. If you're here this morning, and you need to say yes to Jesus. We've got plenty of time. If you came with somebody, they'll wait on you. If they don't, I'll give you a ride home. So I'm gonna invite you to come right now. Come, come and pray by yourself or come and pray with one of these prayer warriors here and just say, I need to give my life to Christ. I want that gift. I'm grabbing that rope by faith and putting my trust in Jesus, the Son of the living God. Would you come right now? Just step out where you are, and it doesn't matter what people think. Nobody's going to make fun of you or laugh at you or point a finger at you. Every child of God has done this. And if you don't do it, you're walking out of here and turning your back on that gift that God has for you. So would you come right now? Just quickly step out and come. I can assure you in a congregation this size, you're, somebody's missing their opportunity. Don't, don't let the enemy of your soul win this battle this morning. Come. Just step out and come. Those are two of the bravest people in this congregation right there. But I believe, I believe with my heart there's others. There's others of you that need to come. There's more of you that need to do just what they did. Don't, don't miss it.
Don't walk away from it. Just come. And if you're here this morning and you're, you're, you do have this, you've embraced this, you've accepted this, and you have trouble sharing this, you say, oh, Pastor, I can't do that. I, I just, I don't know how to do that. I, I don't know how to talk about it. Maybe you just need to come and pray, Lord, give me more confidence. Give me more strength. Give me more of the words to say. Open wider doors for me. Help me. I want to be what he's talking about. I want to be that person that spreads this gospel. I want to sow those seeds. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to come and ask God to give you that strength and that power that you need. Just, just step out and come right now. Come on. Let somebody pray for you. Build your faith. Build your encouragement. Come on. Come on. You'll be amazed at the doors that God will open for you if you'll let him. You'll be totally amazed at what he'll do for you if you'll put yourself in that place. Come on. Let God do it. To embrace the gift that God has given us it's everything. It's our future and it's our present. It's our hope and it's our reality. It's everything. It's everything. Now I'm going to just ask you to bow your heads and pray for these that are here. Would you maybe even extend a hand towards them and ask God to do the work that he needs to do in their life? His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever Oh, for God so loved the world that He gave us His one for God to move on the hearts of people. Let me just remind you of Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, where Paul says, don't forget, my brothers, to rejoice in the Lord. And then he continues to say, it is not a problem for me to continue writing these things to you and 
and it is for your safety. So not a problem for him and for your safety. And what he is talking about is he is talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so John 3, 16, you might have heard that verse a lot, but today he unpacked it and was talking about it's the gospel in a nutshell. I don't care if you've been saved forever. It is safe for you and safe for me for us to continue to preach the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ and remember what he's done in our lives and for new people to find Jesus, the hope of the world and our access to the Father. Man, I am so thankful to serve and to worship here and to see and be a part of everything God is doing. Can I just challenge you? Found people, find people. And all we simply mean by that is if you have experienced the hope and salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, don't hold the gift in, but give the gift away. Tell somebody this week, about Jesus. Share your story and how you've become part of his story. So church, just in closing today, I want to remind you of just a couple things. Number one, tomorrow, everybody say tomorrow, 7 p.m. right here in this room, we are going to have our first Monday prayer. You've never been to a first Monday prayer? Let me just tell you, it is an amazing time of coming before the Lord and crying out to Him and spending time in prayer. And guess what? He inclines His ear to those who are praying. And so I want to invite you. I want to say, come be a part of that. It's one hour where we set aside time to pray as a church and to get in his presence together on first Monday night. And then on Saturday, if you have kids involved in kids ministry, we've got the family fun night, backyard barbecue pit with s'mores and all sorts of fun things. Check that out, scan the QR code at 6.30. We'll meet here. It's not a drop off event. Come spend time as a family because we believe in living in community matters because you were built for community. So guys, won't you stretch your hands out with me today as we declare together this benediction. Say it with me. Teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. God bless you, church. We love you. Have a great day.